All right. Well, welcome to the show today, folks. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I have a friend of mine that I've, I guess, known over the past year and a half here, and uh, he's uh, recently uh, written a book. It's called uh, God's Full Battle Rattle. I'm going to put this on the show notes here. Um, and we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare today with uh, Jeff Kick. Uh, Jeff is a, a Texan here. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> born and raised, born and raised. Yeah. Amen. In God's country. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Jeff has, a uh, um, got a lot of experience with this. this. This was not just an academic study for him. This was a uh, birth out of actual spiritual warfare. And, uh, and, uh, maybe tell us about that. Just, uh, what got you to thinking along these lines about spiritual warfare and about battle? Uh, I, I know, you know, you kind of lay out a little bit about that, but uh, uh, maybe introduce that. Yeah. So, well, so obviously we've dealt with spiritual warfare my entire life. I think we all deal with spiritual warfare. And what I say in, you know, when I start out in the book as well is when you are, when you become a Christian, right? When you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, you immediately jump to the front lines of the battlefield. There is no basic training. There is no training on how to use weapons or how to defeat the enemy or anything like that. You're just jumped to the front line of the battlefields. And one of the things that we don't do very well as a church as a whole is disciple those new believers who just became Christians. So I became a Christian in 1993. And so since that time, not realizing that we are the center focus of spiritual warfare and of spiritual attacks. There's a lot of things that I developed over the course of my life, which really dealt with kind of internalizing things and, and compartmentalizing things, um, holding things in, especially with a career in law enforcement, right? So holding things in, not talking about things. Um, and the enemy was lying to me quite a bit about my self-worth as well. Um, I felt that I was a burden to others. I felt that I was insignificant. I felt that I was, um, you know, that the people around me would be better off if I was just not here. And uh, not that I con contemplated suicide, but I, I, I was a guest on another podcast um, a few months ago, and he basically attributed it to um, a form of suicide, right? You're not killing yourself. But my plan was I was going to find a way to, to get myself to Wyoming or something work on a dude ranch for cash only and get off the radar, right? And just disappear. And then I've, my belief totally was that everybody would be happier and better off that way. Now that's something I've been dealing with my entire life. What brought it to a head, um, and I've, like I said, I've been a Christian since 1993. I have taught youth. I have taught um, adult Sunday school teaching group or groups. Um, I have been involved in worship ministry. I've been involved in a lot of different ministries, a lot of different ways of sharing the gospel. And I have taught the armor of God. I have taught on spiritual warfare, but I never really truly understood that until, uh, like I said, my, our, entire, our entire lives, we've dealt with spiritual warfare. Right? We have two adopted children. Those were both struggles to get those adoptions done um, and to follow through and be obedient with what God wants us to do in those times. And then, you know, financially too, you know, we, we, I mean, our life is an example of when scripture says that God will provide your every need, not your every want, God will provide your needs. And so we've never been or had like a surplus of funds or anything like that. So we've always struggled with things throughout life. In the fall of 2022, there was multiple things that happened in a very, very short period of time, which is what sparked the idea for the book. Um, so these things that happened, and we're talking uh, an accident that resulted in several broken bones in my body. We're talking um, uh, a loss of friendships um, that were they were very, uh, you know, dear to me. Multiple friendships, right? And then we had medical bills, my kids breaking their arms and legs, my kids getting in car accidents, uh, my wife dealing with medical. I mean, just it just piled on and piled on and piled on and piled on. And it was, wasn't until we were having conversations with some of, the, some of the people from my church about these things that I really started to realize what the root cause or the root issue was in my life. And that was that lie that the enemy has been telling me for 40 something years about the worth of myself and who I am. And, and that sparked me to do 
uh, my intention, because I have a podcast as well, so my intention was to do a six-part series on the armor of God and spiritual warfare. So I began to go through and do a lot of research and write a lot of notes in order to do this six-part series of the podcast. It got to the point where God was like, good job writing notes, but this is going to be a book. Um, and, and I've been prepping you to write a book. And so, um, you know, I got through all of the parts of the, of the armor as, I, as, as the Lord had kind of led me to that and what revelations I was becoming. And it was like, and, and mind you, I've been a Christian for many, many years, but just in the course of one year, because this book was written in about six months, but in the course of a year, I had grown so much in my relationship with Christ because of the things I was learning and because of the recognition of the spiritual warfare and the enemy's lies that I had been believing for so long. And I, and I knew there was other people out there who were dealing with these same issues. I know there's people out there because that's the tactic he uses against us. So I, you know, it, it was already written, right? I was already writing the notes. All I had to do was kind of, you know, finish off a couple of things, get somebody to help me format it, and then put it into a book. And um, and yeah, that's how the that's how the book got started. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, you know, I'm reminded of something that a friend told me. He says, you know, God does His best work in our perceived worst times. Right. You know, when when we're about to die, or when you know, when we've had an accident ourselves and, you know, you got yourself, uh, I think it was a thrown off of a four wheeler, was it? Or Yeah, it was a, it was actually a four seater side by side ATV. Yeah. It was going pretty fast. And we hit a, hit a turn and myself and you uh, hit a tree. And, uh, <laughs> I hit a tree. Yeah. Uh, another guy that was in there, he was thrown, landed on the street. Um, luckily I hit the tree too, because it was pretty deep, pretty steep drop off on the other side. Um, and there's still, I mean, it's funny today, I, there's still parts of that accident. I don't remember. I have, I have no idea how I exited that ATV. I mean, through investigation and photos, I can figure out how I got out of it, but I don't have any recollection in my memory of getting out of that ATV and hitting that tree because in my mind, I was in the fetal position about six inches off the ground and flying across the ground, watching that tree come to me. So my actual rec rec recollection of the situation has no ATV in it. I'm just flying until I hit a tree. Um, but I know that's not the case because it was literally just a couple of feet from the time I left the ATV to the time I hit the tree. So, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty intense time. I think the worst part of that accident wasn't the accident itself. It was the week after the accident because, you know, we were there with a group of men. We were going to spend the week together. This was like a church outing, wasn't it? At, yeah, we had a group of men that were there. We we're going to spend the week together, studying the word a little bit, going out on some four wheelers and ATVs. And um, this was on our way back for lunch on the on the first day. So myself and the other guy, we we just stumbled around the house the rest of the week. We couldn't. We were in so much pain, and we were making each other laugh, which was worse because then we were laughing because we were hurting, and it was just it was a horrible time as far as what was planned versus what happened. But I got closer to that group of men than I ever would have if everything had gone as planned. So it's a, it's a very, it was, it was a hard time, but that in and of itself wouldn't have sparked a book like this. It was that followed by multiple other things at once. And, and there's a lot of things that I was working on in my life for example, the podcast was getting better the, and bigger. There was a couple other things that I wanted to do that was ministry related and stuff. And, and it almost feels like the enemy's like, yeah, there's a lot of things I don't want you to do. And then tries to inter, interfere um, with those things. So who knows the reason? Um, we also know that sometimes God puts us into situations, right? God puts us like the refiner's fire, right? He puts us into trials and he puts us into things in order to make us more pure for him. So we can't always attribute everything that happened to me to spiritual warfare and enemy attacks. But those there's very many of them that were obviously that's what that was. And so that's that's kind of what led me on that that journey. That was a very exciting year for me actually, despite the fact that those things are what sparked it. Yeah. 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 Well you know my experience. I was actually on your podcast to yeah, as a podcast, the Testament podcast, and we'll put a link for that. But 
you know, uh, when you and go, you were on, by the way, in February, 2023, you are episode number 104 for anybody that wants to find you a little bit quicker. <laughs> 104. 104. That's, knock, that's knocking them out, brother. Good for you. <laughs> but, uh, what was I going to think? Yeah. Those, those times like that, you know, I look back on it and, you know, you wouldn't wish it on your enemy, right? but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And right. you probably have feel the same way now that you've kind of come through this and gotten this experience, you know, of knowing the word of God kind of experientially. You mentioned you taught, taught this for, you know, 30 years or so to churches, youth groups and on and on. But it, it takes on a different flavor when you're in the thick of it and you sense that spiritual battle. You know, you can sometimes it's almost tangible. You can. Mm -hmm. feel it I, I i say you know uh the atmosphere that you're in the title of the book battle rattle what let's where does that come from you know so i wanted i'm one i'm one of those guys that i'm like i, I like things that make you ask questions right so battle rattle was one of those things and what i did is i didn't want to put armor of god there's so many books out there called armor of god right and so i didn't want it to be armor of god or or god's armor or anything like that so i started researching a little bit and there are some military branches that call their gear battle rattle um, because you have so much of it on when you're walking everything's rattling right so unless you're like a covert like navy seals or something you know all your junk's just rattling around so i think it's maybe the army or um, there's some branches that will call that battle rattle so i was like cool um, let's call it battle rattle and so i did some research and there's already some books out there called battle rattle and they have to deal with military and things like that and i was like okay well how about full battle rattle and uh and so there's already books out there called full battle rattle so i so how about god's full battle rattle well, there's no book out there called god's full battle rattle so that was what i settled on but i enjoy that kind of stuff right because i, I like that question why battle rattle why did you choose battle rattle um because the the armor of god is much more than what most people think it is um there's a lot in there that we can miss if we're just reading scripture or running over it or talking about the different things in the, in the armor of God. There's so much more that Paul is talking about that relates to, and honestly, when I think about it, and I did this, I was reading the book, I was thinking, you know, if you could think of any attack that the enemy can give to you, and what I mean by attack is not, and remember, we have an enemy, he sends flaming arrows, right? That's scripture, flaming arrows, you get attacked. Um, but we also have another enemy, which is ourself, right? So the enemy can bring things to us and thoughts and temptations and stuff like that in our minds, but it's still up to us to decide whether or not we succumb to that or if we overcome or, or decide against or for whatever. So we still have ourselves that we have to worry about too. But when we look at these different pieces of armor that Paul talks about, they, when you look at all of Ephesians and all of the armor of God, the armor of God combats against every single attack the enemy can bring to you. So you think of any conceivable situation, any conceivable temptation, any conceivable um, thing that might lead you into sin, there's a piece of this armor that covers that. When I talked earlier about um, my degrading myself quite a bit, right, and feeling like I was insignificant and a burden and I was worthless and all those other things, when you look at the helmet of salvation, which extensively talks about, within Ephesians, extensively talks about who you are in Christ as a child of God, adopted with full inheritance the, uh, of child. I'm like, and, and I have adopted children, so I understand this concept, right? So you are an adopted child of God with all the inheritance and rights that are coming to you. And that is very significant. It means that I am extremely significant, right? With however many billion people there are in the world, God still cares about me and the needs that I have and the things that um, are important to me. And he still wants me to love him uh, beyond measure. And so to understand and reckon, yeah, to understand and recognize that we ourselves are so important to him, despite what we think. So that's just one piece of the armor, right? It talks about righteousness. It talks about, so the way we should live. Uh, and so all these different pieces, 
come together and that's, you know, that's how I got battle rattle. That's how I got all this stuff. You, you put it all on and there's so many people. I was, I was in a, a prayer gathering one time and the topic was about God's, um, the armor of God. And there was a guy praying and he was sitting next to me and he goes, uh, my God, I'm, I got, I'm thankful for your armor that you give us, that you protect us every day with your armor. Thank you. Thank you for that, God. And, and, and I had just finished this book, right? And so I'm, in my mind, I'm going, mm, that prayer needs to be a lot longer and a lot more in depth because the armor is not just something he has put on you to protect you. It's something we have to put on daily, right? So, yeah. So your Roman soldier didn't wear armor 24-7. They had to put it on every day. Um, and it's it's heavy. And that's where I talk about community, too. You know, the armor's heavy. you got to have people to help put your armor on armor bearers. That's what they're there for. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I was just standing in the Roman Coliseum here about a week ago. Yeah. And I was, you know, we're taking the tour, which is four or five hours. And, mm. you know, I'm sitting there looking and, you know, the Coliseum and you know, hold like 80,000 people, the gladiators. And, and that was the very thought. One of the thoughts I had as I'm looking there and is these, all of a sudden you would probably have silence with 80,000 people and hear some guys walking out, clink, 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 making that rattle, that battle rattle. He's <laughs> fixing to go into battle. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that's, that's really good. So I appreciate all the work you've done on this. So let's, let's break it down with some of these different pieces of armor. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Let's just do a deep dive here and uh, let you uh, share your heart. Uh, I don't know if you want to start with the helmet or who our enemy is. And uh, You know, I, I, th I think everybody understands that the, the, the devil is our enemy, right? But what Paul explains very clearly, which is something that hit me hard, because remember, part of the things that happened in this short period of time was betrayal from friends, right? Um, false accusations, things like that. And so what I come to realize through digging deep into this, and I already knew this, and that's what I'm saying. If we don't study the word to really understand what the word is telling us, we miss things. And so I already understood, I already knew this, but I didn't understand it. And that is our enemy, as Paul says, is not flesh and blood, right? It's not the people. Now, people do things wrong to us. Yes. Are they influenced by the enemy? Absolutely. Do they allow themselves to be influenced and be a pawn in the enemy schemes? Yes. But that doesn't mean that they are the enemy. Okay. So the enemy is, as Paul would put it, all the principalities and the rulers and all that. So he's talking about in the spiritual realm. And so all of, you know, the devil himself, the demons, uh, all the, all the bad spirits that are out there, that's where our battleground is. It's in the spiritual realm. We're not talking about, um, you know, the, the scripture says there's no weapon on earth that can defend us against spiritual warfare. So we're not talking about real, you know, guns and bow and arrows and swords and all that other stuff to, to fight the spiritual warfare. We're fighting spiritual enemies. And so that's where our battlefront is. So that's the enemy, right? So the, they are the ones that influence. And all of our human, what we call enemies, humanly enemies, are influenced by those bad spirits. Okay? We'll just, that's kind of the short version of, of summing all of that up. They're influenced by that. Again, they make their choices like we do. So they can choose to be used as a pawn or not. Um, Non-believers, um, non-believers, the enemy has already got non-believers where he wants them, right? So y you may not have a bit, <laughs> they may be like, well, I don't have a problem in my life. Yeah, there's a reason. That's because you're not, I mean, you're still in the bondage of hell. And so when you think about a prison, um, you were, as a non-believer, in the bondage of hell. You were in the devil's prison. And so when you escaped that, like anybody who owns a prison or runs a prison, if you have an escapee, you chase that person, right? And so the enemy, the second you escape, you become a believer in Christ, he chases us. That's when the arrows start flowing worse at us, more and more of them in many different ways. And so that, that attack goes. Now, the, the enemy knows because he knows Scripture. He knows Scripture better than we do. He knows that he'll never get us back. 
but he also knows that he can distract us, detract us. He can get us uh, further away from Christ, further away from any ability to spread the gospel to anybody else. He can do whatever he can to make our lives just terrible. And so that's, that's our enemy. Okay. What a lot of, and then we get into the armor pieces here too. So what some people don't recognize, and I put this in the front, and, and I say they don't recognize it because I myself didn't even recognize this. So when Paul talks about the armor of God, and he he lists off, and I'll, I'll quote it here. Um, give me a second. To, okay. So it says, we're in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. I'm just going to read the part where he talks about the actual pieces of armor. Um, and so he says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, in, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now, sword of the Spirit, he defines it, which is the word of God. And you wonder why, why did Paul not define the other things, right? Why did, not, why did he not further define in that section right there, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sandals of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth? Why did he only define the sword of the Spirit? Well, what many people might miss, which I did too for many years until I really started digging into this, is he does define it. He defines it throughout the entire book of Ephesians. So he goes into the helmet of salvation. In other words, our worth as a child of God is covered in chapter 1, verses 1 through 23. The shield of faith, right? So this is, uh, this is his faithfulness to us. And we might think, well, uh, man, my, my faith is terrible. Uh, my, my faith is not good. I don't have a strong, strong enough faith in him all the time. He's, Paul's not talking about our faith in God here. He's talking about God's faithfulness. Because any shield built on my faith would crumble, right? It would not be strong enough. But we're talking about the faithfulness of God. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 of Ephesians, he talks about the faithfulness of God. He goes into detail on the sandals of peace. Peace being our peace is found in Christ, right? So we, we think about all the turmoil we have here on earth, and peace by definition is an absence of conflict. So how in the world is there peace on earth? There's not. There's peace in Christ, in heaven, in eternity, right? So our peace is there, and he talks about that peace. He talks about our peace with one another as believers, and he talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2.11 through chapter 4.16. So then he gets into the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate of righteousness being how we should live as believers, right? The righteous way to live. That's covered in Ephesians 4, 17 through chapter 5, verse 7. And then finally, the belt of truth, right? The truth that, that holds everything together. Belt being like a girdle, all right? That's kind of what, that's what, the, what he's talking about here is a girdle. And it's one of the first things the Romans would put on in their armor. They would put this belt on. That's what also holds the sword and keeps their midsections, you know, firm. Like if we were to put a, a weightlifting belt on, right, to protect the core of who we are. The core is this, this truth, right? So he covers that in Ephesians 5, verse 8 through 6. Verse 9, verse 10 of chapter 6 is when he starts talking about the armor of God and putting on all these pieces. So he says the sword of the Spirit and defines that as the Word of God. But the other pieces are defined very in-depth and very clearly throughout the first portions of the book of Ephesians, which I think a lot of people miss that correlation. But he's right there. I mean, he, he That's what Ephesians is all about. He's not the first one in Scripture to talk about armor of God in this sense. It was covered in the Old Testament as well, different pieces of the armor. But the way he lays it out, um, I think it's fantastic. It's a, it's a great look um, at what he's done. And the other thing too, and this is just kind of to, to top it all off, I guess, he talks about prayer and prayer constantly. And so what I recognize through this is, is prayer is not prayer, and it's also not 
armor that you put on, prayer is a weapon as well. So we see the sword, we also see prayer as a weapon. It's our communication to God. I think the analogy I use in the book is very similar to a military who's using radio communications to communicate with all of the other people in their in their army to try and um, maneuver themselves to outflank the other the enemy or whatever in order to overtake the enemy. Well, that communication is one of the first things that the enemy will try to take out. Radio towers, communication trucks, things like that. They'll try to destroy communication, and I'm talking physical enemy, real you know armies. Will try to destroy the communications mechanism so that that army can't talk to itself, and it would be weaker against them. So, the the enemy wants to take out prayer, right? That's that's a weapon that we use when we speak to God. Man, how many times have we found ourselves too busy to pray, too busy to sit down? open up the Word, read about Jesus and get closer to Him, and pray and have a conversation with Him. That's something that if if we just pay attention, we'll start to see that. Hey, I want from 6 a.m. to 6.30, I'm going to spend time with the Lord, right? So I get to work at 6 o'clock. I start spending time with the Lord. Lo and behold, somebody else in this world is awake at 6 a.m. and starts sending you emails and work, and you get distracted. And all of a sudden, you've missed your prayer time that day. So if he can eliminate or significantly reduce or make it ineffective, the prayer that you have with the Lord, um, he's winning. Mm. Now, I like that. Then kind of what you said earlier, you know, you know, Satan knows he's lost. He can't keep us from being saved. But the next thing he tries to do is just to cut off that fellowship, mm -hmm. cut off that communion with God. And that is just so important. Uh, you know, Jesus, the busyness of life that we have it right now, is just, I keep thinking, you know, I'm getting older and older. I want to slow down and slow down. And, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was, uh, you know, it really hit me when I was in Italy for a period of time here recently. Uh, my brother would text me and say, hey, you know, let's go for a walk early, you know, walk and see some of the cathedrals or whatever. I mean, nobody's up <laughs> and I, I'm not a coffee drinker. I, you know, I, I may be, be What's wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. I, know, and I was going to set that up. Yeah. I'm not, my brother has to have his coffee. So here we are walking around and I mean, nothing is open. I mean, we're in a big city, Florence, Italy, mm. and the, the shops, it, they don't open until nine o'clock. Yeah the busyness, the hurry that Americans have versus there. Absolutely. And, you know, if, uh, I mean, I just had to take a chill pill going into a restaurant to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jeff, I don't know about you, but you know, I want my food and I want it hot and I want it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and it's, you know, when you, you walk in, they seat you and it, it may be another five minutes. I'm like, where, you know, where's our, where's our waiter at? You know, what's this? And, uh, you know, it could be a two hour experience or, you know, two and a half hours, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, the busyness of life. Yeah. So I agree hundred percent. One of my oldest son is adopted from Uganda, right? So we spent a lot of time throughout the adoption process. And then we went several years after that in a row to do mission work over there. Um, we stopped going in COVID. We haven't been back. We kind of really want to go back, but in those times of the adoption, we didn't have, um, you know, cell phones and stuff in, I mean, you could get them, but we weren't getting them at the time. So when we were over there, our only communication with the outside world was um, on the computer somehow, sending an email or uh, I think it, we used Skype or something back then um, to communicate with our kids that were at home still. But you had nothing to do but spend time with the Lord, and it was so fantastic. But what we learned about the country of Uganda, and, and one of the Ugandans we, we knew said it the best. He said, time in Uganda is elastic, meaning you can say we're going to have a 30-minute lunch. It's going to be four hours. You know, we, we rec experienced that ourselves. We had a court time for the adoption. It was like two in the afternoon. We ended up having court at like 6 p.m. because the judge took a break. You know, and so we're sitting around for hours and hours and hours just waiting. But 
but time is elastic. It's like they're in, they're not in a hurry. Um, and, and I, I love that lifestyle, but I also didn't. <laughs> so, so I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. So I guess this, um, what do you, what do you have? Is it 25 years? You got law enforcement? Yeah. 25 years. I just hit 25 years in April. So I bet you have some stories that you could sh- share or think about where you encountered the work of the enemy. You know, the, law enforcement's a hard job, and it's even worse now than it was back when I was in street patrol, right? So I haven't been in the streets in a uniform um, because of my assignments and my promotions. I haven't been on the streets in uniform in over 10 years. Um, and so even then it was as a supervisor. So I haven't actually answered calls, um, responded as a patrol officer in 15 or so years. So um, it's much different then than it is now. It's, it's a little bit worse now. Society as a whole, uh, we, we still, in the city where I work, we have great community partnerships and our community supports us. Um, tremendously, but law enforcement as a whole across the country is really getting a bad name right now. Um, and it has to do, you know, there's a lot of different factors, right? Media attention and all this other stuff. But um, I can tell you that in my time, not only spiritual, but physical warfare, I played that off, right? I mean, I can look back on it now and say, oh yeah, that was definitely it. Anger, bitterness, um, a desire for revenge, um, seeing the horrible of the horrible in society. The worst of the worst is what you go to the calls of. People who have hurt children and you pin that up. And so for me, I can look back and see those things. But for me, just in the moment, just answering calls from call to call. And that was just life. That was just career. One of the things I did is completely compartmentalize all of that stuff. I didn't take that home to my wife. I didn't tell my wife those stories. I didn't, you know, because I was like, I'm saving her from, you know, the reality of the world out there. Um, And so the only people I would ever tell those stories with is other law enforcement, which was not productive. And so... So those are some things that really got pent up for a long time. Definitely, definitely can look back on my career and see where the enemy has attacked. And I've allowed it. And so um, there's just, there's a multitude of different things. Yeah, I don't really want to go into a bunch of different stories about about things that happen, you know, on the streets or anything like that. Um, And and there's some guys that can't, some guys can, for me, it's like when when I compartmentalize it and lock it in a little box, I, I don't remember it anymore. It's weird. Um, so I can think back on my entire career and I can only think of two or three really hairy situations. I know there was a lot more, but for some, I, I guess my brain just blocked it out. A, a, you know, a lot of people, yeah. I know a lot of people, yeah. doing, it's kind of a defense mechanism in some way. Yeah. Where, and I, I know you know, there's guys who can remember every little thing they did. <laughs> those, those are the ones that write the books. <laughs> We had a great guy. He was a believer, too. We had a great guy just retired from here and went to his retirement party, and they were showing all these photographs of him throughout his career. And I'm like, I don't think you can find five pictures of me throughout my 25-year career. But, yeah, that was hard. Um, it's It's been a, a wonderful career. Worked for a great city. Wouldn't change anything at all in the past 25 years, except I, I wish I was more aware of the enemy attacks through that time frame. I think I would have handled a lot of things differently, but the way I handled stuff, you know, that, that point's good. Let's maybe drill down on that a little more. How are people not aware or how can, how can we be more sensitive to know, okay, this is a a spiritual attack from the enemy. You know, this is, this is coming at me. This is happening. What are some, do you have any advice on any of that? Yeah. So first is staying grounded in the word. Um, and grounded in prayer, because the easiest way to recognize an enemy attack is to recognize that something's not consistent with God. Something's not consistent with God's character or what he's asked us to do or, or things like that. So things that are inconsistent with, with what the word tells us or the way the word tells us to live, um, something's wrong. And that should be a red flag. And I put a little um, toward the end of my book, there's an exercise called the, called the C3 exercise. And so it involves three things. Number one is circumstance. And so when we recognize that we are in the midst of some kind of a circumstance, right? So something, we don't just come 
wake up one morning and we're mad at somebody. We don't just wake up one morning and we fall into addiction. We don't just wake up one morning and we look at something we're not supposed to look at. We don't just wake up one morning and do that. We are put into a circumstance. There is some kind of circumstance, right? So there's an opportunity or there is a thought or there is um, you're just in a position with which this could happen, right? So scripture even says there's no temptation in the world that you don't have an exit door for. Okay, that's what that's what the scripture says. For every temptation, there's an exit door. Whether or not you choose to take it is up to you, but you're still in the midst of some kind of circumstance. That's the first C. The second C is compulsion. What are you compelled to do because of the circumstance, right? So in my situation, a friend betrayed you, a false accusation, um, other friends, you know, whatever, have hurt you. And so what do you want to do about that? Well, you want to be angry. You want to be bitter. You want revenge. You want to pull out every bit of evidence you have to prove that you're, that, that the accusation is false. You want to do all these things that Scripture says and God's character says are not what we should have, right? We shouldn't have anger. We shouldn't have bitterness. Vengeance is the Lord's. It's not ours. We should, you know, we should draw closer to Him, not not engage in battle with other people. And we should have peace amongst believers and not fight and quarrel with one another. And so Scripture says all these things, right? But that's our compulsion. That's what we're compelled to do in that circumstance. And then the final one is certainty. What is the certainty of the truth of God? So what we do, if we are able to recognize the circumstance that we're in, then we can complete the C3 exercise. The problem is, Sometimes we're just blind to the fact that we just are in this position right now. But if we can recognize that this is a circumstance we're in, we are compelled to sin. We are compelled to do something that God doesn't want us to do. What? And those are the enemies. Those are the enemy's lies that he's giving you, right? So he's going to tell you anger's okay, bitterness is okay, it's okay, they deserve revenge. It's you know He's going to tell us all these different things. But the truth of the matter is, the certainty of God's truth is where we kick it in the in the rear, right? That's when we start taking out these things where God says, do not be have anger, do not have bitterness stored up in your heart. Bitterness is a foothold toward the enemy. You know, all these different things that basically are the truth against the lie the enemy is telling us. So, and I've, I've done this on a couple of things, right? So, um, uh, trying to think whether my, my wife would be okay with this. So my wife had breast cancer several years ago. She had a, a double mastectomy going on. And every time that she goes now to get her blood drawn to test cancer numbers, things like that, she has very high anxiety. And so at, understandably so, right? So, but she struggled with it and struggled when they talked about it. And, and after doing this book, is when I tried, you know, for the first time in reality, put this C3 method into place. And I said, okay, the circumstance is what? Well, that I have to go get blood work to see if I have cancer. And that makes you compelled to do what? Makes me compelled to worry. Makes me compelled to have high anxiety and to, to worry that I'm going to get cancer again, that I'm going to die, right? And like it goes on and on and on. And I said, okay, what does the truth say? Well, the truth says, do not be anxious about tomorrow. The truth says, do not worry, right? Do not, all these other things. Because the truth is those things. Why do we not worry? Because when we worry, it is a distrust for God. If we are worried about something, that means we don't trust God to take care of it. Mm. And so, gratefully... Say, and, say, that, say that again. That's so yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we worry about something, then we have a distrust that God will be able to take care of it. And so we worry, and and that even even though you know these things, we still worry about stuff, and that is when we take this C three method. We're like, okay, I'm in a situation right now, I am compelled to worry about this, but here's the truth: God says this, 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 and this, and so that truth is that sword of the spirit. That's the truth, the word of God, and that sword of the spirit is what hacks down those lies that the enemy's shooting, and so. Um, Using that C3 method, the last time she went to get blood work, she told me, I didn't have any anxiety. I wasn't worried at all going in there. And so, you know, not to say not to say that it's going to work every single time because we know how the enemy operates and we know how we get worried about things all the time. But that's just one example, right? So we can recognize, if we can get to the point where we recognize the circumstance, 
then we can follow through with our compulsion and then follow through with the truth of God. But we have to be able to recognize that circumstance first, and that comes from being grounded in Scripture and, and understanding God's character and remembering what He has taught us and what He has told us. Um, and we're not always, and this is the final part of my book too, but we're not always able to do that. So we have to be in community with other believers. Um, especially, you know, if you're a woman, be in community with other women. If you're a man, be in community with other men. And I'm not talking, let's get together and read a book of the Bible and do some prayer. I'm talking in community to the point where you are able to be vulnerable and share with the rest of the group the struggles that you go through, even on a daily basis. Hey, I'm this week I am really struggling with this, 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 and this. Right, So then you have a group of people who you trust, who will take that and bear that burden with you, lift you up in prayer, um, and not only that, but follow up with you in a day or two and see how things are going and maybe talk through some very vulnerable things with you. Um, and, and that, in, this is just my opinion, right? I didn't do research on this, but my opinion is that kind of person that you can have that kind of relationship with is one that God places in your life. It doesn't work to just go out and pick somebody and say, hey, would you be my vulnerable friend? <laughs> you know, uh, I, that just doesn't work. Um, and, and I think that's something that very few men understand, uh, and maybe men and women understand the need for that kind of a friendship. My wife has a, a friend who, I mean, it, there is no holds barred when they go to lunch, right? They talk about anything under the sun, struggles with children, struggles with school, struggles with whatever, uh, and they have no problem with it, and they provide each other with advice and scripture, and they pray together, um, and it, she says it's so refreshing when she comes back from that. A lot of us believers are missing that kind of relationship, especially for men who are supposed to be head of the household and men that God has appointed as head of the household, as spiritual leaders for the family, if we as spiritual leaders for the family are not doing what we need to do, meaning staying grounded in Christ, being vulnerable with, with somebody else that can you know help us through things, allowing people to help us through, that was my deal. I wasn't allowing anybody in. Um, I, had, I had closed off everybody. Well, in the book, it's kind of it's interesting for me. I was just going to let you keep going, but in the book, you know, you you mentioned you uh, you weren't the touchy feely guy. You know, you didn't you were like, had a barrier. I'm not, like, you know, Ken's not getting in, and and you know, kind of an isolationist or out there by yourself. Well, because okay, and and law enforcement just made it worse. But I think it's the same thing with all men. Um, I'm a man, and I need to be a man. And as the head of the household, I need to show no fear, no you know whatever. And if I am vulnerable or show vulnerability, that, in my opinion, may, makes me weaker in front of my wife and my children. And that was my thought process. Now, I cry at movies. I cry at cartoon movies. I know you're um, a softie. <laughs> I am. I'm a sensitive, and my family knows I'm sensitive like that, right? But what I would not do is be vulnerable and talk to them about the things I struggle with. And so they knew there was a soft side in there, but dealing with the things that I struggle with internally was never a topic of conversation. Yeah. And I think it's so important. You know, I think of the Psalms that David said, thy word have I hid in my heart hmm. and how we need to know the word of God um, and have it in our heart and, you know, not just have it on our phones or, you know, okay, pull up Psalms 23 or whatever, but to have it in our spirits, you know, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly where it just, you know, it's like a, an, an overflow that the mm -hmm. word just is so there. And I use a, the deal about Jesus. And of course, everybody knows, you know, he's in the wilderness, 40 days fasting and Satan comes for him, the son of God. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus couldn't say, well, I, you know, hang on a minute. You know, let, me, let me go over here to the synagogue. I got to get the scroll out. I, 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 you know, I, what's 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 the scripture for this? I'm in this yeah. situation. 
But Jesus just said, it is written, you know? Yeah. And and I love what you said about how, you know, Satan knows the scripture. After a couple of times, uh, Satan starts quoting scripture or twisting it, just like he did in the garden uh, with uh, with Eve. But, uh, yeah, he, you know, so maybe speak to that a little bit about being grounded in the word uh, and, and uh, you know, the sword of the spirit. So um, I, I have severe ADHD. Um, to the point where I'm actually in the middle of six different books. And so I've got books on my Kindle. I carry my iPad around all the time. And so depending on my mood or, the, or whatever's going on in the day, I have six books on my iPad and actually seven. So I've got one book in my office that I'm kind of going chapter by chapter. That's because my brain doesn't like to stay on track with one thing at one time. It has to kind of sporadically move around. So I'm in the middle of all these different books. But what that means for me in ADHD, I'm sure there's a way to overcome it. But memorizing scripture is fine. Memorizing the book, chapter, and verse is hard. So that's the things that don't stay in my, in fact, numbers by themselves don't stay in my brain. I can buy a car one day and the next day I can't remember how much I paid for it. So because those numbers just don't stay in my brain unless it's a phone number or Maybe a social security number. That too. He, he just yeah. said it's written. He, he didn't say. <laughs> it's, right. It's, it's written. And he did that a lot, actually. He didn't, I don't think he ever said it's written in Isaiah or, you know, whatever. Um, but anyway, so what I do, and I, I put this trick in, in the book as well, but what I do is I know Bible, the scripture says this. I'm not sure where it is. So obviously you can search, you know, Google search or whatever um, and look up that verse. And when those things come to mind, when you're like when you're doing the C3 method and you're going through and finding all the different truths and you say, I know that scripture says not to worry. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own problems. Yeah, but I don't know where that's at. Okay, so we but we need to find it, right? So when it's time to do the C3, yeah, when we're doing the C3 method, it's not enough just to quote the scripture, but we have to find this. We want to find the source, the actual book, chapter, verse. We want to find that. Go find it. And then those those certainties, those truths of God that overcome the compulsion in that circumstance, those truths we speak out loud, not in your brain. We speak them out loud loud those truths why is it, why is that important to us to speak so them out loud first of all things become real when you speak them out loud um my wife and i both knew we wanted to adopt a child but it didn't happen until we both said it out loud but not only that the enemy is not omniscient omnipresent all those things right the enemy can't see and hear our thoughts but we want to tell the enemy i know the truth and so we're going to speak it out loud and so we're going to speak the truth he knows what he put in our brain. He knows what he threw this way and what we're probably thinking, but he doesn't know, you know, like he can't read our thoughts. So we have to speak it out, speak that truth out loud. That truth out loud, especially when you say the Bible says this, Jesus says this. Anytime you use the name Jesus, demons run, right? So Jesus this, Bible this, this is what the truth of God says. And it over, I mean, you have to try it because it overpowers all of that stuff that's been building up, that compulsion, the things you're compelled to do, when you start speaking truth out loud, it does overpower what you want to do. And it helps you to realize what we should do, not what we want to do. And so that it's it's great. If you've never done that before, and some people are really weird about that, I don't, you know. Yeah. There's power in that. 100%. There's power in making that proclamation and declaring, you know, this is the word of the Lord, or this is the scripture says this, and yeah. Jesus says this. Uh, you know, there's an authority. You can have an opinion on anything, but when you say it is written, mm -hmm. God says, or, you know, there's there's a, a certainty, the truth uh, that comes with that, and, and there's power. Yeah, and, and Christ is the perfect example of that. When you see him tempted by the devil out in the wilderness, each one of his responses starts with, it is written. It is written. It is written, right? So he's quoting the Word of God. He's activating the sword of the Spirit, um, which is the Word of God. Um, the other thing, too, when we look at the circumstances that we're dealing with, when we look at the compulsion, the, the first two C's, um, oftentimes we don't really know what the Bible says about that. What does the Bible say about anger? What does the Bible say about bitterness? What does the Bible say about this? So one of the things I put in here, too, is another little trick, and um, any of your search engines would do it, but if you type in three words or 
type in two words, Bible say. That's all you got. You don't even have to make a full, complete sentence. Just Bible say something. Bible say anger. Bible say bitterness. Bible say whatever. Multiple sources will pop up in the first few search criteria that will kind of isolate the different scriptures. What I like to find, and it's actually a, play, uh, a site called openbible.info, and I like to use that one because it doesn't give you commentary about these scriptures. It just gives you the scripture. So it'll give you like 50 different scriptures that talk about anger, 50 different scriptures that talk about bitterness, or whatever the topic is you put in that line, 50 different scriptures, and then you can click on it. And when you click on that scripture, you can have another option to click on the entire chapter of that book, and you can read through in depth all the different references in Scripture that deal with that. By the time you get through studying that, you've forgotten your compulsion and your circumstance, and you know what to tell the enemy out loud. The Bible says this. It is written this. Jesus said this, you know. Yeah, well, I think it talks about, like in Romans, about renewing your mind. Yeah. You know, once you get off that train of thought, like, you know, once the scriptures say, if you're in a temptation and you're thinking about something or, or, you know, doing something that, you know, you know, you shouldn't, you know, uh, that when you start rolling those scriptures around in your head, that's where the victory is and start speaking it out for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the father. Yeah. So if I yeah. have those things, I know that's not of the Father. Right. It's black and white, right. clear. You know. Yeah. Um, you know. And it, so there's a there's a power activating mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. Yeah, and remember too, and you've already said it, and, and I've said it, and that the enemy knows the scripture, but he likes to twist it, right? So he twisted it with Eve in the garden. He twisted it with Jesus, even um, in the temptation in there. And and I had a I had a good friend. He was a new Christian, a new believer. He was in the midst of a uh, men's Bible study that we were having. And and the question came out, you know, have you have you been spiritually attacked, right, to the group? Well, of course, me, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> let me just let me just tell you all about it. Um, and other people, well, this this guy, this new believer, he's like, I really don't feel like I've been spiritually attacked. I'm just growing in Christ and growing in Christ. Okay, cool. So then we ended up discussing John chapter 5. Well, in John chapter 5, it talks about the fruits and the vines, and bad fruits will be cut off from the vine, all these different things, right? And so the leader of the group asked, well, what do you all feel about this? How do you all think about this? And the same guy, he goes, man, it sounds like, you know, um, if, if we're not – if we're not, if we don't do good, if we don't live the way God wants us to do, he's going to cut us off. We'll lose our salvation. And I was like, okay, stop, right? So that's the enemy twisting scripture here. That's not what's happening. That's not what he's talking about. So we pulled out a bunch of other scripture that talks about how your salvation can never be taken away and all, you know, all this other stuff, how you're a child of God forever and ever. But you have a little bit of scripture that's taken the wrong way or out of context because the enemy twists it for you. And if he didn't, if he if he wasn't involved in community, if he wasn't getting discipled by others in his growth in Christ, he could have easily got past that, you know, or or believed that, and then spent however many years of his life trying to be good, hoping that that would help him in his salvation, which is completely contrary to the gospel. Yeah, I know you you talk about COVID nineteen and the book and community and mm -hmm. fellowship and isolation. Um, and how that really changed the church altogether. I mean, you know, yeah. you had people at the time, I mean, you know, some people, uh, no big deal. You know, I, I do, ch I'm, I'm talking with Jeff. I'm having fellowship with Jeff right now. You know, we're, we're having church. And <laughs> um, yeah. so they were like, you know, almost happy in some sense that, you know, I don't have to show up on Sunday. You know, I catch this stuff on a Zoom or YouTube or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, maybe speak, and, speak to that a little bit about where people are. So a lot of churches are still live streaming their services, uh, which is fine. I think that's great. Um, they're still live streaming their services. But if you'll listen to some churches nowadays when they speak from the pulpit, they also address the people speaking out, that are sitting at home, right? I get it. We're sharing the gospel and everything. We're, we're They're still having church or whatever. Community was meant to be community. That means let's get together, let's shake hands, let's talk, 
Let's grow together. Let's learn together. Can we do that online? Look, we did small group Sunday schools online during COVID. There was no bonding there. It's a computer screen, and I know it's your friend, but it's very difficult to have that kind of community and that kind of relationship over a computer or over a phone. That's my personal opinion. Uh, there's probably some research out there that would back that up, but I don't know that for sure. But I have got to sit face to face with somebody, especially if I'm going to have somebody help me through hard times and be vulnerable with them. It's not going to be over a computer screen. We're going to sit, we're going to talk, and if I have to, I'm going to cry, and you're going to be right there with me, next to me. And that's what community is for. That's what it's all about. And so, you know, God didn't say, when, when everything's done and I bring the new heaven down, that I'm going to have all of you guys in your mansions and we're going to Skype each other. No, it's fellowship with one another. And so we're going to spend we're eternity gonna in heaven. We're going to have a big meal together. Better, better be, yeah, better be some steak. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, and, and if your listeners are like, you know, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an online church guy. I don't like going to church, but I can get it online every Sunday. You know what? That's, that's great. That's great. But I'm telling you, you're missing something. Um, there is a great design from God for us to fellowship with one another. And he didn't have Skype in mind. He didn't have FaceTime in mind when he when he designed us that way, and so um, and 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 I think anybody, I don't want to say anybody, but um, I think most people can probably tell a huge difference in meeting with somebody in person versus talking to them on the phone. Oh, no doubt. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think God just wired us for community, for fellowship mm -hmm. with Him and with other people. And when you, when you cut that off where you don't have that at all, yeah, that's when the enemy can really, uh, you know, give us some lies or start speaking some twisted truths to us. And, you know, maybe we get off base. Uh, um, you know, I've kind of, I'm kind of a lone ranger myself to some degree. And I can relate to you. Yeah. But that's, that's what the enemy, that's what the enemy wants. Right. He, he, he wants us to be antisocial alone and deal with things on our own because he makes us believe that we can. Right. I've had people, I've had people tell me, Jeff, well, I'm kind of like Elijah, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like Elijah, you know, I'm, I'm out here. I'll, you know, I'm fighting the battle, you know, I got yeah. to control and, uh, you know, for some, depending on where they're at, you just kind of let it go. But, that's not the way I think God intended for it to be. No, look, if you think you have your, everything under control, take a look at your relationship with Christ. Because if you think everything's under control, I've got it all under control, we're good to go. Well, you just said, I've got all under control. That's a lie from the enemy. You know, and, and he's going to make you believe you've got it all under control. And as long as he can keep you away from your relationship with Christ, meaning he's going to keep you from your prayer life, he's going to keep you from your scripture study, he's going to keep you from a relationship with Christ, He's going to make you think you've got it all under control. Well, check yourself because I'm not so sure that that's the case. I think anybody who is sold out to the Lord day in and day out doing everything he wants to do is going to face battles, spiritual battles and attacks. And it's going to be hard. And the only way that they will continue, continue to have an appearance that everything's okay is if they're locking it away. And so there's, there's got to be a group of guys or a guy to trust and be vulnerable with to say, here's my struggle today. And I just don't, I just don't see that kind of vulnerability occurring on the phone or on FaceTime or whatever. Um, you need to be able to see eyes. You need to be able to talk and have conversation and meet. And that, to me, I think that's important. And I think that's what God meant in community. Yeah, I have a, I guess, sort of a ministry to pastors. A, a lot of pastors, you know, I feel like that they feel like they can't maybe be honest or have the yeah. type of relationship you're talking about. And, yeah, and it always touches my heart and always, uh, spirit of compassion. You know, when you hear some of them, you know, I say, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to go to lunch with you. W would you have lunch with me? Yeah. 
I mean, I'm like, wow. Well, you know, this this guy's a pastor of a big church. And, mm-hmm. But, you know, when he starts sharing and, you know, for a lot of those guys in ministry, you know, you, I think uh, <clears throat> that uh, honesty, the vulnerability or the relationship, you, if you don't feel like you can do it in your church, you, you need to find somebody, yeah. uh, you know, pray that God would send you somebody or someone to come along your way. But, you know, I, I've always found that with pastors uh, and I love this and with them and sharing with them but you know there's just a a need for that yeah yeah 100 percent. i mean you're talking about people who think that expressing a vulnerability will cost them their jobs or you know i mean but pastors are not pastors are not superhuman you know and the pastors know this and so they know they're going to get taxed just as much as any of us will and they're but they're, more. they're 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 yeah Absolutely. And, but they're probably also more likely to kind of pin that up and tuck that away and not address it and not deal with it. For me, 40 something years, again, my whole life packing things away, I had what I thought was an understanding with God, right? And that was, uh, okay, I'm going to pack this away. We'll talk about it, seek forgiveness, all that other stuff. And then you and I, we're just not going to talk about this again. Uh, And so that was my understanding with him. Like, I, yeah, but that's not what was happening, right? That was not what was happening at all. But that was my understanding of it, is that God and I have dealt with this already. No, God and I didn't deal with this. I hid it. I put it away. I left it alone. And it's an enemy attack, enemy lies that I just continuously believed over and over and over again. And every time I believe it, I just tuck it away, put it away. God and I have an understanding. We don't talk about it. That's Those are lies. And that's not God's intention. That's not how he operates. And... I, I was not good, right? I, I thought everything was cool, packed it all away. Oh, no, that's not how it was at all. I broke down when I realized how much the enemy was lying to me and how much I was believing. And I, I don't know how many times I broke down with a group of men and just shed tears and just let this out that, oh, my gosh, here's what he's been telling me my whole life. And my whole life I've believed this. And this is what I've thought of myself. It wasn't until I started researching for this book that I recognized the fact that humility, the way society views humility, um, is exactly what I thought I was doing by being insignificant, by allowing someone else to take credit for something that I did or by, you know, uh, making myself less than someone else. I thought that was humility. That's not humility. Humility is recognizing who God is and what he's created me to be, and believing and trusting that he will do as he's promised for us, right? That's humility, humility placing Christ first. What I was doing, the form of humility I was doing, which society believes to be humility, was not humility, but rather pride. And that is, look what I did, I elevated that person. Look what I did, I made myself lower. Look what I did, look what I did, look what I did. And I end up demeaning myself and putting myself down and and just really making myself feel lower than dirt because I thought that's where my position was. Hiding that under humility, that was really pride. God hates pride, right? But that's what that was. Not the humility of elevating Christ above me, the humility of of. It wasn't elevating anybody. My humility I was dealing with that was prideful was demeaning myself, putting myself below, not elevating somebody else. <laughs> That's a lot to pack into 100 pages, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, it's interesting because, you know, I was talking to the the lady who published it originally and I said, well, how long should a book be? And she said, you write till God tells you to stop writing. So that's what I did. I wrote till God told me to stop writing. And I've gone back and read it since it's been published. And every now and then I try to dig into a a chapter or two. Um, But what I recognize is this this book just scratches the surface. There's so much more um, throughout Scripture that deals with these things. Um, So I don't know, maybe one day I'll write a sequel. (laughs) Yeah, well, that'd be good. Where can, uh, if, if some of the audience wants to reach out to you or um, do you have, how, how can they contact? Yeah. So I've got a podcast called the Testament podcast and I have a website called the testament pod.com. 
And so if you type in thetestamentpod.com, it'll take you to my website. There's a place there that you can actually fill out um, information or a question that you have or just drop a line. And that will – you submit that on the website. That will send an email to me. Um, I Yeah, so it's either that. You can also just email me at thetestamentpod at gmail.com. And that – but if you just don't want to go to the website, you can go there. You can get all the episodes off the website um, and other information too. So, yeah. Email me, thetestamentpod.com. Tell me you want to be on my podcast because here's what my podcast. My podcast shares people's testimonies in Christ. And we've spun off on some other things um, throughout time. It's, it, my podcast strives to brag on God as much as we can through the things he's done in people's lives. So, man, if you got a listener who has like a – it doesn't even have to be an amazing story. I've had people tell me before, yeah, I don't want to give my testimony because it's boring. Right. Right, you yeah. accepted Jesus Christ in your life and became a child of God eternally. That's not boring. So I don't care if you want if you have somebody that you're listening that wants to feel like they need to share their testimony. Tell them to email me. We'll get them on the guest list and we'll start back in the fall. Yeah, Amen. Well, uh, maybe just uh, leave leave with a a prayer or uh, you know a parting thought here with the with us. Yeah, you know, a parting thought. Shoot, we've got to recognize the attacks that are, exist. It is nonstop. It is forever. The enemy does not take vacation. He does not take breaks. It may not be the devil himself who's tempting you. It may be a demon, maybe a group of demons. It may Who knows what it is that's actually putting these bad things into your thought. But recognize this. The enemy's been around since the beginning of time. He's been dealing with humans for two, two plus three thousand years. We haven't changed a bit, and neither has he. He uses the same tactics, the same buttons. He does everything the same, and it works. It continues to work on us. So we have to recognize the circumstance we're in, the compulsion that we want to do, and the truth that goes against it so we can help to combat ourselves against those flaming arrows, right? So that's that's one of the things that we as believers have to recognize. We're in the midst of a battle always and forever. There is no time with which the enemy is not shooting an arrow at us. So we have to recognize that and be prepared for it. And yeah, I'd be glad to finish that with a prayer if you'd like. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to be able to share a little bit about the book, a little bit about the armor that you provided for us, how we can put that stuff on and how we can recognize the different enemy attacks that are coming at us. God, even as we speak now um, in this podcast, we know that the enemy is conniving away to distract us or even make this podcast not air or whatever. He's got some kind of tactic that he's using right now to try to distract us, me as a guest, Ken as a host, and all of the listeners that are listening right now too. Maybe, just maybe, they didn't even make it through this episode. But I got to pray that you will just bring them back, help them to hear about the enemy attacks that are present in us, the spiritual warfare that we deal with daily. And I pray that your word be elevated and glorified, that people will come to a desire to get closer to you, a desire to dig into your scripture and to develop and further that relationship with you so that when they are attacked, they can recognize that and address it and deal with it and pull out the word of God as a sword to defeat it, the, uh, the lies. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Thank you so much for allowing me to even write a book. Um, you and I both know, Lord, that I'm not a writer, um, but I was able to complete this one. So thank you so much for that. And uh, just pray that your will be done in all. We just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's powerful. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on.